Back to the Red Dice Stories RPG podcast with John and Hannah. Hi. And today we're going to be talking about maps, and specifically we're going to be talking about maps as inspiration for your games. Okay, so this is what we hope will be the first of a short series of episodes we're going to be doing about maps, and we'll go on to talk about our tips for making maps and using them in games. But first of all, we wanted to talk about maps purely as a source of sort of inspiration for you when it comes up as ideas. And I think first of all, I'd like to obviously say that the first way I think maps can inspire you is if you're planning on drawing your own map, Mm -hmm. for whatever reason whether it be a world map or whatever it helps to have a look at either some real world maps or maps that have been designed by professionals who do that sort of thing there's tons and tons of this stuff on the internet it takes seconds to go and have a look through what other people have done and take a few ideas yeah, and, and, it, and don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those people who's going to, if you put, put a map out there on the internet, I'm going to jump on you and be like, oh, that's not how rivers work, or whatever. <laughs> uh, and you know who you are, those people out there. But um, even if it's just sort of like getting an idea of how sort of like a coastline looks, how to make it look like it's a real coastline, or like the rough sort of shape of mountain ranges and stuff like that. One of the best things that they're there for is to tell you how far it is from one place to another yeah. and what's in between, and nothing can do that as quickly as a map. Yeah, and I mean, if we look at sort of like fantasy novels and sort of like mm-hmm. the most well known fantasy novels, I mean, take like Lord of the Rings, for instance, a lot of these sort of like journey based, sort of expansive world sort of fantasy novels, they'll have a map in them. I mean, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, they yeah, all had a map I, in them. I remember the ones from Narnia. Exactly, yeah. And there's something about a map that makes a fictional world, or a game world in this case, seem more real. Mm -hmm. Because we're used to looking at real world maps. So having like a map laid out in front of you, even if it's only like a vague map, like here be dragons written on most of it, it ties it down and makes it seem like more sort of like a real world. Now, one map I've been looking at recently, which I quite liked, is... um, one from the Lord of the Rings project.com and that is an interactive map of Middle Earth. And it's really cool. It's a nice sort of detailed map in the sort of old school style. And but you can add on things like paths so you can like have a look at um, the paths that like Thorin and Company took and it lays out on the map. You can have a look at where Gandalf the Grey went, where Gandalf the White went, Aragorn um frodo and sam and it just sort of overlays like a line on the map which is really cool Mm -hmm. you can highlight certain places so like settlements mountains and hills sort of Mm -hmm. forests and it just sort of gives you a little pointer that you can click on and you get a description so if i if i click on show forests i can see in the middle of mirkwood there's like a little green point and if i click on it it tell, brings up a little pop-up saying, Mirkwood was a great forest in Rovanon, east of the River Anduin. The forest was originally known as Greenwood the Great, but the name changed when it fell under the influence of the Necromancer. And then it gives you like a link to read more on the Tolkien <laughs> Gateway. So I think that's pretty cool, because it not only allows you to like look at this amazing map, but if you want to delve into it a little more detail, you can do. And obviously the people have put like a hell of a lot of time into this you can even bring up like a timeline of events and things Mm -hmm. like that so Mm -hmm. i think that's really cool you know and if you if you're going to run anything sort of vaguely like lord of the ringsy whether that's um adventures in middle earth the one ring or whatever you could do far worse than checking this out this is something else a map can tell a story very very quickly yes because you do just look at that and you see oh yeah frodo started over there he goes across yeah. And you can see all the places that the adventure happens and you instantly remember it. That's it. And I think as well, it also allows you to like maintain... If you have like a map, it allows you to sort of maintain like an internal consistency with your game world. Now, we all know in like fantasy worlds, like crazy, like magical shares can happen, but you need some sort of internal consistency because if it's purely chaotic and anything can happen, how do your player characters like know the rules their worlds occupy under? So, for instance, when we're playing a D&D game, we assume that like gravity works. You're not going to step out your house and like float up into the sky. And like if there's no rules on the table at even that basic level, how would you do anything mm-hmm. if it was purely chaos? But, um, yeah, 
having these maps helps you maintain internal consistency so especially as a gm if you're sort of like drawing a map you've either got one or you're drawing it as you go along you know that when the players say oh how far away is rivertown and you're like oh yeah it's about 50 miles to the east when they ne- next ask no matter where they are as long as you've got that map with those points on them and you've got some sort of distance you can tell them oh yeah it's now three miles to the north or whatever and they're not going to be going like hold on but we've only moved like two miles and now it's like 50 miles extra away so we were supposed to be frothing about different maps that inspired yes yes you are right and saving our tips on map making and yeah how to use yeah. them for later episodes okay well, one other thing I'd like to go for for maps that have inspired me is I've met, I've been looking a lot recently at these like um, these sort of like um, crypto maps that show like where in the real world sort of like uh, cryptozoological creatures like the Loch Ness monster <laughs> and stuff like that come from, and I've got here a a map of world mythology designed by Simon E Davis, which shows like a number of famous monsters from around the world and shows you where they're sort of encountered. And that ranges things from like the. Uh, the, the, the let me just see. So, yeah, so we've got like a, a Pegasus here, and it's obviously pointing us towards sort of like Greece. We've got sort of like Celtic mythology. And this one, although each one has like a sort of iconic creature depicted, it mainly sort of tells you like the types of mythology you're getting from those areas. So, if you look at where it's pointing towards. The UK it says Celtic mythology, Arthurian, Scottish, Gaulish, Welsh, and Irish. And there's like an anvil with a sword on it, presumably representing the sword in the stone. And that's quite cool, but it doesn't go into like a lot of detail. But if you wanted to use that as a jumping off point, you, it would tell you what the sort of types of mythology were, and you could read into that a little bit. It's also a really nice way to look at sort of how you'd lay out the monsters in your campaign world yeah um you could literally do that with any campaign world and go oh this is the area where there's this type of creature uh this is the dragon territory this is the griffin territory whatever you like so how about any maps in particular that inspire you love so one that i particularly liked that you've either seen or you haven't is the earth sea map if you want to pull that up okay and this was in the front of the earth sea books by ursula k leguain and if you see the world map sort of in the center of it there's like a central sea that's labeled the innermost sea yeah and to the west of that there's this whole continent that's been completely smashed yep. into loads and loads of little islands. Mm-hmm. And that's been done by some sort of magic in the past of the... Hello, pussycat. That's been done by some sort of magic in the past of the world of the stories. Yep. And I can't spoil the Earth Sea stories for you. I can't remember enough of the details. But I do remember... When I was about 13, 14, first getting into D&D, really fixating on this idea and later making it into a campaign world when you and I were first seeing each other, so when I was about 17, 18, and having a map that was made to be an island so uh, an enormous mountain yeah it was your thousand islands campaign wasn't it yeah i I didn't want it to be called the thousand islands campaign but that name sort of stuck where they make the finest salad dressing in the lands (laughs) but yeah if i remember correctly you like dropped a load of beads onto a piece of paper and then sort of used that as inspiration made a pile out of beads and dice yeah so it was a mountain and held it on a piece of like thin cardboard, quite a big piece of thin cardboard, and then I got you to punch it from underneath, yeah, so that the mountain literally exploded, and then drew round all the little beads and all the dice, and made the different shapes of the mountains yeah. depending on which dice had been that point. So, so basically, not only did the sort of earth sea inspire you to. To have that approach of like, oh, it's a place that like blew up. It actually inspired the method you used to create. The Effectively, map. yeah. And looking at that map, 
you can see, can't you? Because you remember that campaign map. Yes, I do. It yeah. does look very similar. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that wasn't entirely intentional, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've got to admit, when I'm looking at this Earth Sea map now, and I, I mean, I've read, I think, the first couple of like the Earth Sea books. Uh, I've got vague memories of the map, but I seem to remember that certainly there's a lot of sort of there's a lot of sailing around by boats because there's a lot of small land masses. You know, it's all sort of like different islands mm-hmm. with different cultures and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And obviously, Earthsea is not really like a sort of pirate campaign, but it, the map very much puts me in the mind of that sort of vibe. You know, all these little small islands, little sort of havens with different traditions and stuff like that, and then just like masses of ocean between. So, if you're looking to run like a, a sort of naval campaign or like a pirate campaign, the Earthsea map would be great as inspiration. And of course, the other map that I've got to talk about if we're going to talk about maps, yeah. is the one that sits on the back of Grey Tattooing in the Discworld books. Because often when the story starts, it begins with a description of the turtle swimming through the galaxy with this map on its back and then zooms into a part of the map. And it's quite a clever little detail to remind people of like the bigger world going on around whatever smaller part of the story it's in. Yeah. And of course this is another map that's been designed sort of with a very specific idea in mind. Yeah. This being it's a flat world. Yeah. And he did spend some time looking at the geography of this world and how it'd work, but most of it is purely aesthetic of having this like central spike of a mountain and various other mountains around it. And then if you look somewhere over to one side, there's a continent that's the counterweight continent. Indeed. Because and for those of you who can't see where Hannah's pointing, which is all of you, because we do a podcast, she's pointing at the northeastern sort of part of the map where there's, a, on the version uh, we're looking at, there's a sort of brownish like continent marked... No, I think that's 4X, sorry. I think oh, okay. the counterweight continent is the smaller island just sort of to the west northish of that. Of that. But yeah, um, the idea being with the counterweight continent that they're physically a lot, lot heavier, but that allows them to balance out the fact that there's a huge landmass on the other side. I'll stop it tipping up. And they're very mineral rich, which means that they're very technologically advanced compared to the rest of the disc world. Yeah, and a so lot that's of this nice. stuff so that's from, informing the sort of yeah, because he started off with this world map that he'd sort of produced to make this like one idea work for the color of magic and the light fantastic, and he'd not really considered beyond that. Yeah. But then he took the time to explore lots of different ideas, and I'm really gutted that we didn't get the later books that were going to be about some of the other continents. But anyway... um, I mean, I think to to stick on the vein of, like, flat worlds, another map that I really like is the um, Within the Ring of Fire map. mm -hmm. Now, although I'm not the biggest fan of the game itself, I think the map is really interesting, because, again, it's a flat world like this Mm -hmm. world, but... The, the sort of barrier at the edge of it is like this this huge ring of fire where it gets its name from. And that's the interesting effect of the fact that all the tropical areas around the edge of the world, and the nearer you get to the centre, i.e. the further you get away from this ring of fire, the colder it gets. So you have like an in-character sort of reason within the fiction for having like your Arctic bit in the middle and all your tropical bits around the edge. So I really quite like that as well. And I think... I think it's quite interesting because in a fantasy game you can you can obviously make your world whatever shape you want. And if you look in science fiction, we've got things like disc worlds, Dyson spheres, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. In fantasy, we've got like the old um, Hollow Earth and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So you can do whatever you want. But it is nice, as you say, when the author or the creator puts a little bit of extra thought into it to like not a hundred percent sort of like scientifically explain why things are there but just to give like a bit of a nod to a sort of rationale or some sort of mm-hmm. reason for things happening like the, the counterweight content they say yeah if you put it under intense scientific scrutiny <laughs> it doesn't make a great deal of sense uh, but it that's works where the narrativium comes in <laughs> yeah that, that's also where the bullshitium <laughs> comes in 
but um, it it works within the sort of framework of the story. And like you say, the, the whole like exploding mountain thing in Earthsea. Mm-hmm. If, if a real mountain exploded, would a world end up like that? Probably not. But it works within that setting. So I think the real sort of takeaway you can get from these maps is that creating a map can give your world a sense of this like internal consistency and also it rewards you putting a little bit of thought, encourages you to put a bit of thought into it. It can help you to work out these sorts of things like the idea that oh, it's probably going to be a volcano over here. Well, what's that going to mean? as far as the creatures that are over here. Yeah. What's that going to mean as far as the people that are over here and the plants and the... Yeah. If you haven't got a specific idea of what you want everything in your world to look like... Yeah. Then it's a really good way to give you inspiration to help you work that out... And if you have got a really specific idea of what you want the world to look like, it helps you show that to other people. Yeah. And I mean, I'm. I mean, we're not saying by all manner of means that you have to have everything 100% laid out in your world from the get go. In many ways, I think you're better no, not to, because no, then you've left yourself <laughs> you've left yourself room to manoeuvre, like as things come up. But. Having sort of like the broad strokes sketched in, even if it's just like, oh, there's a big continent here, there's a little continent here, and there's like a group of islands with some pirates here, can help you sort of maintain consistency. So when the player characters are like, oh, have we heard any rumours about like what's over the sea? You're not fumbling around for an answer. You, even if you like keep it vague, you can be like, oh, yeah, there's supposed to be like a huge like jungle continent to the south, or, oh, oh yeah, a few leagues to the south, there's like the pirate islands where... Where the, the sort of like the Buccaneer Brotherhood dwell or whatever, and it just helps you maintain that internal consistency, and it gives the impression that your world is much larger than the sort of like the area that you're zoomed in on, where the where the sort of player group are focusing their attentions. And as someone who runs sort of like a lot of hex crawl style stuff, mm. I love that. So in my in my Smoke and Snow OSE campaign, we're focusing on like a single small sort of subarctic continent. And we've got three maps of that that we've like zoomed in on to like a sort of hex level. But I've got a sort of rough idea of the sort of like the world. So as they're pe- they're finding out information, they're also hearing rumours about it. So I know that whenever I mention these, I sort of know I'm I'm doing the same thing and I'm keeping it consistent within my game. So can you think of any other maps that you find inspiring? Google Maps. Just yeah, being able yeah. to go on google maps and look at other parts of the world in that top down view um well look at britain as well in that top down view although i've looked at that a lot more before yeah but particularly unusual places um places like i was looking at the eye of the sahara not long ago that may or may not have been atlantis because it came up on some ridiculous video about ancient aliens or some other so, trash so, I was watching. So, so it probably wasn't then, to be fair. <laughs> it's one of the more convincing theories that I've heard. Um, yeah, but to be fair, saying it's one of the more convincing ancient alien theories is like saying it's one of the least smelly <laughs> I've just trodden. No, no, just, just that there might have been a settlement there that might have got trashed out by the sea. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm not giving credit to Probably. any other part Probably of it. Probably wasn't, though. That that might have been built with that particular circular construction. But it, it's a really cool geometric feature that's been inhabited a few times yeah. by humans. And I think to, to round off this episode, I think that's a, an important point you make there. Because much as we all sort of like go for these like bizarre theories and stuff like that and we sort of discount mm-hmm. scam as you've heard me scoffing at them just okay in the real world probably wasn't true there probably wasn't some like golden civilization known as atlantis that got got like sunk beneath the sea and even if there was it probably wasn't what the popular sort of fictions imagine it to be but in your game world maybe there was a great empire that sank below the sea maybe the world is flat and you can bring in all these sort of weird and bizarre theories. Maybe your yeah. world was visited by ancient aliens in the past that set up all this technology. But all we're saying is if you the more bizarre a thing you bring into your game, 
the more you need to like give a little bit of thought about how you mm-hmm. incorporate it in with the the more sort of largely normal stuff that you bring in. Mm-hmm. So if you're like, oh, I want to have like a, a huge mountain, like Olympus style, where the gods physically live on your world, you've then got to sort of think, yeah, well, what effect does that have on your world when people literally know the gods exist because they're there on a big mountain? Do they come down from the mountain? How do they interact with people? So you, whilst you can do whatever you want in a fantasy world, yeah, just try and keep it a little bit consistent. Use your map, and just sort of think about it a little bit. So I think that's it for this episode. Mm-hmm. We hope you've enjoyed it, and we hope to be doing a few more episodes on maps over the next few weeks. If you want to get in touch with us, maybe tell us what your favourite map is. Perhaps get featured in a future episode. You can do it in a couple of ways. You can leave us a voicemail using the Speakpipe website link below. If you're having trouble with that. We still have our old Anchor account available that you can leave a voicemail on. Again, link down below. Or you can send us an email to rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. And until we speak to you again, take care, and whenever you're playing, have fun. Bye.